Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à toutes. Welcome to the Canada School of Public Service. My name is Marc Fortin. I am the Vice President of Research Partnership at an organization called ANSERC. ANSERC stands for the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. We are the organization that funds every year about $1.1 billion of scientific research in universities and colleges across the country. Um, we fund 11,000 of the best researchers in Canada, 30,000 students a year. And these are the people who are the inventors and innovators of the future. So today I'll be the moderator for the event. And I really want to thank you for uh, joining us today for this event. But before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining you today from Ottawa, situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. And we want to recognize their stewardship of the land and hope to be inspired by their knowledge from coast to coast to coast. Today's event is the fourth installment of, of the Canada at a Cutting Edge of Innovation series of the Canada School of Public Service, which is delivered in partnership with CIFAR. CIFAR stands for the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And the goal of the series is to introduce public servants to leading scientific experts who are focusing their research on key questions that uh, we, Canada, and overall globally, we uh, are facing and will continue to face in coming years. Today, it's really fascinating, a really fascinating event uh, on the topic of the human microbiome. Well, the microbiome actually describes the ecosystem of bacteria, fungi, viruses that live inside us. Each one of us has a different microbiome. Our microbiota are completely unique to each and every one of us. They're shaped, the, the microbiome is shaped by our genetics, our environment, and the microbiome is an important determinant of health of our health. Um, joining us today is the CIFAR fellow, uh, Dr. Carolina Tropini, who is assist assistant professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering, Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Carol uh, British Columbia. <laughs> Carolina, a very, very warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're a very, very busy person, and we value your time with us today. I can attest that you're a, vi a busy person because um, most of my career, uh, prior to joining the public service, I was a researcher myself at McGill. So I'm still able to read uh, some of the science publications. And colleagues, the publications of Carolina are just, just stunning, not just in quantity, but in the quality of the work uh, that she does and who she collaborates with. She, could, she works with the best in the world on the topic of the microbiome. So we're very, very lucky to have you today and really thank you for making time. Carolina and her team use a combination of cutting edge experiment, experimentation, experimental and computational techniques to study how physical environments affect the microbiome. Carolina, I can't wait to hear your presentation on humans and the microbiome. But before I turn the platform to you, I just um, want to um, bring a few housekeeping items. Uh, we want to, you know, we of course want you to have the best experience possible. So we recommend that you disconnect from a VPN. You may want to join from a personal device uh, if possible. And if you are exper experiment experiencing technical issues, we would recommend that you relaunch the web webcast link that was sent to your email. Over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, Carol Carolina will be uh, walking us through her presentation. And after that, we will have a fireside chat, a question period with uh, the audience. So you and each one of you 
in the audience will be invited to submit questions. Uh, you can submit your questions throughout the event in the Collaborate video interface. You'll just go to the top right corner of your screen, click the raise hand button and enter your question and we will be monitoring uh, the inbox uh, throughout the event. Simultaneous translation is available uh, for participating participants joining us on the webcast. So you can choose the official language of your choice on the video platform. Without further ado, Carolina, the floor is yours. I can't wait to hear your presentation. Carolina. Thank you so much, Marcus, for the lovely introduction. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming to this presentation. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. So I live, work, and learn, and do research at the University of British Columbia, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Umasquean people. And uh, my lab studies the impact uh, of the gut microbiota on human health. Uh, you may wonder about my title. Uh, it's talking about uh, industrialization and metamorphosis. And the reason why I'm going to, to be telling you about industrialization is that we can't understand the microbiota without putting it into the context of our broader human ecosystem. Part of the reason why this is the case is that in the lab, we study a number of chronic diseases uh, that uh, are really involved by with the microbiota. And over the years, we've been learning that uh, the root cause of a lot of these uh, so-called modern diseases. So here I'm thinking about inflammatory bowel disease, uh, diabetes, allergies, uh, or obesity are really rooted uh, in our changed lifestyle due to industrialization. And I'm gonna start telling you about uh, the importance of our microbes to our health, but uh, I will frame this from the perspective of uh, industrialization. Industrialization has really defined uh, the growth uh, of human communities as we experience them today. And importantly, it has impacted uh, living systems from the micron to the global scales. Over the years, what I found uh, are really important are the parallels between the micro scale world uh, and uh, our global scales. And these connections are really astounding and it has very much changed the way that I think about uh, human health. To uh, kind of tease in point uh, here, I'm showing two images. One of them, the one on the right is a microscopic uh, gut section and the other one is a satellite image of uh, none of it. These images uh, span over 12 orders of magnitudes of space. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is that really everything that is happening in our environment uh, has a parallel inside us. And generally that the same forces that affect us as humans are also affecting the ecosystems that are within us. When we think about the macro scale, it's really obvious that the cost uh, of industrialization has been really massive from the destruction of forests to increased pollution, we are now estimating that about uh, a million out of the 8 million species of animals that are present on Earth uh, are on the risk of extinction. And importantly, the other ones that are not at risk of extinction have really had to adapt. Industrialization has also had a cost uh, to the environment uh, inside us. As Mark mentioned, uh, inside us live tens of trillions of organisms. And to give a sense of how many this is, it's about 100 times the number of stars uh, in the Milky Way. It's a really incredible number of entities that live inside us and uh, help us uh, uh, through our lives. The reason why the microbiota is important to us and to our health is because they're a little bit like a personalized pharmacy in our gut. Anything that they produce and that makes it uh, into our intestines will go through our blood system, the same way that when you take a pill by mouth uh, uh, can affect uh, our headache as much as it can uh, affect uh, our allergies. We're heavily changing our gut habitat due to industrialization because we've changed the way that we eat, the way that we fight disease, and also the way that we interact uh, with our own environment and with our human communities. All these factors change the gut habitat, and uh, we're finding that they cause long-term change, not only to the microbiota composition, but also in what uh, these microbes are able to produce, and that in turn changes the pharmacy in our gut, and that can affect our health, particularly as these changes happen uh, early in development. And importantly, industrialization has put a really tremendous pressure on these organisms and has led an incredible number of bacterial species uh, to disappear. And throughout the talk, you'll see why uh, this is important. Something else that uh, has uh, come about is that uh, these modern diseases that I was telling you about very much change the environment themselves and will also affect uh, the microbiota, creating a cycle. We also take uh, a lot of over-the-counter compounds uh, which affect the gut environment. 
to give you some examples, for example, if you have a fever, this will change uh, systemically your body temperature. This very strongly affects the way the bacteria can grow uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the gut and the, how they can reproduce. On the other side, when we take anti-inflammatory drugs, this may change the temperature in ways that uh, are less physiological than what the body wants to respond to. When uh, we think about anti-acids, we're changing the acidity. And finally, uh, another measure of, uh, uh, which I guess at the macro scale you would think about as salinity, is the measure of osmolality or the concentration of uh, molecules that is present in an environment. This also very strongly affects uh, the gut environment, and this can be changed uh, due to malabsorption, so people that are lactose intolerant uh, or due to laxatives or, for example, colonoscopy preps uh, will very strongly change this type of uh, environment in the gut. And we used to think about uh, all these uh, effects as being very acute. So how come can they actually change uh, the environment so strongly? And here I'm going to zoom back out uh, to the macro scale. With global warming, we're only talking about a couple of degrees of temperature change. And this is leading to the extinction of over a million species because the warmer temperatures are disrupting the natural equilibria. Now let's turn this back to the gut. Global warming is very much akin to what happens uh, in our body in the presence of a fever. And of course, a fever may only last a couple of days, but what matters is the relative time scale to the growth of these organisms. So bacteria have a life cycle of tens of minutes, and for them, a day can account for tens of generations, which is very similar to what polar bears are experiencing uh, with global warming. So the fact that we change uh, the physical environment over timescales of weeks with over-the-counter drugs or with this type of chronic diseases really means that we are changing our gut microbiota in a way that uh, can be permanent. And what we really want to understand is uh, how is this going to be affecting our health? So far, I've told you that uh, our changed lifestyle through industrialization uh, has impacted our microbes. And this initially has led to really important improvements to human health. Here I'm thinking about development of vaccines, antibiotic, new drugs, improved hygiene has really allowed this unprecedented reduction in infectious disease. And this has really correlated with the incredible growth of human populations. But this also has come at a cost because mirroring the sharp decline in the incidence of infectious diseases, there's also been an alarming surge in autoimmune and allergic disorders. And it was about in the 90s that scientists began to wonder if these two trends were connected with the idea that maybe the reduction infections was actually affecting the human immune system in a way that uh, it caused it to malfunction. And we're finding out that this is indeed the case. The reason why this is happening is that the antimicrobial therapies affect more than infectious agents. They also affect uh, this type of commensal bacteria that uh, we, uh, as we'll see, we have evolved with and that, that are important to our health. The question is now becomes, why would changing this microbiota actually affect our general health? And the wisdom that we know about this comes from a very long time ago. Uh, it was uh, even Hippocrates that uh, uh, at 300 BC said uh, that all diseases begin in the gut. We're very tied to our gut because this is where we're exposed to a lot of the compounds that come from the outside, whether they're from the diet itself, uh, whether it's from exposure to pathogens or whether it's from the production of uh, molecules from our microbiota. And there's also been uh, uh, in philosophy, uh, for example, Thurback saying that we are what we eat. We've very much been connected uh, uh, to, to our food and to our, the way that our gut function uh, in order to understand our health. What we're learning right now is really that the key connection between a lot of the way that, for example, different uh, drugs may function in different people are really determined by the way that the microbiota is able to metabolize them, as well as uh, all the other factors that I've told you so far. And we have to start thinking about our microbiota as affecting beyond the gut. It's not just uh, localized uh, to our intestines. It will be affecting everything that uh, our blood system will be able to reach. So, so far I've told you that industrialization has changed our lifestyle. And the next two things that I'm gonna be telling you about uh, a little bit of two vignettes uh, is gonna be about uh, the impact of over-the-counter drugs uh, on our microbiota. And then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what our lab has been thinking in terms of uh, trying to restore these ecosystems. I've introduced uh, uh, how uh, we, we think about the microbiota and how the environment can be changed. 
So one of the ways that in which uh, I told you about uh, the environment being changed was that uh, in the measure of osmolality or the number of follicles that are present in, uh, in the gut. And it is actually one of the mode of uh, uh, functioning of laxatives. So laxatives are these non-absorbable compounds, uh, particularly osmotic laxatives, for example, Miralax, or Restorilax, uh, uh, or magnesium sulfate. These are compounds that our body cannot absorb. And in order to equilibrate uh, the osmotic potential, it, this causes water to be drawn out of the epithelium and increases uh, the motility. Also, I apologize because I realized for uh, uh, those of you on the East Coast, uh, this is very close uh, to lunchtime and uh, we will be talking about laxative for the next few slides, <laughs> just so you're aware. Laxatives are not only used uh, for uh, colonoscopy preps, uh, uh, but they're also very highly used uh, in the general community. So in the United States, they're the top two digestive remedy. And this is also true in Canada, very, very highly used. And uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is they're also very highly used in the pediatric population. We wanted to understand uh, how laxatives uh, impact uh, the gut microbiota. And one of the measures that uh, we think is really important to think about uh, this ecosystem from a broad perspective is uh, looking in situ, looking at what happens uh, uh, at, uh, at the gut lining and the gut interface with the microbiota. So here I'm showing a micrograph. Uh, this is very similar to what you would see by taking a biopsy. This is a, a, an experiment done in an animal model where you see that here on the right-hand side, these are the intestinal cells. Uh, so our, these are what we refer to as the host cells. The, uh, when we think about humans, uh, we are the host of this microbiota. These intestinal cells are very tied uh, to the bacteria, to the microbiota that is here highlighted in red. The, these bacteria produce these compounds uh, called short-chain fatty acids that become uh, absorbed and they're the primary food source for the intestinal cells. But as you can see, the intestinal cells also produce this uh, green substance, this mucus. And this provides a barrier to the microbiota because we don't want it to, to penetrate, we want it to keep at bay. But at the same time, we're so tightly linked to our bacteria that we feed it through our mucus. So we've evolved to have a mucus that uh, has uh, compounds that the bacteria can break down. And here you see them uh, as they're eating through this. And so we have this really beautiful balance in, in this interaction that the bacteria make something for us and we also keep them uh, uh, safe within our gut environment. What happens during the laxative treatment is a little bit like what uh, I imagined for, uh, for a, a tornado or for a tsunami. The laxative treatment causes such a large change in the ecosystem that it causes the stripping of this mucus layer. So now all these bacteria that before were separated from us become in contact. And this uh, leads to a very strong immune response, uh, even against uh, commensal bacteria that normally we, we like to keep uh, close by. This also very much uh, changes uh, the way that the bacteria can interact uh, with our mucus. And like we know, these uh, conditions are have a, a, a time period associated with them. Once we stop taking these laxatives, uh, the system reforms. But importantly, we'll see how this microbiota changes. The way that uh, we assay how the microbiota is changed is by sequencing. So what we do is that uh, we'll have uh, these um, mouse models where we can inoculate them with a microbiota from a human patient. So they start out without any microbes and uh, we add on uh, uh, a microbiota from humans so that we can actually look at specific patient microbiotas, as well as microbiota from, uh, from mice to, to look at the broad series of um, bacterial species. Here, what I'm showing is a graph of how the abundance of these different micros will be changing. And, and the names are not really important, uh, but I wanted to make sure to, to highlight them. So Morimaculaceae and Bacteroidaceae are two families of bacteria that, as you can see, make up a pretty large fraction of the microbiota. In fact, uh, Moribaculaceae starts out at almost 50% of the abundance. So every other bacterium belongs to this family. And what we found is that during laxative treatment, these bacteria are completely depleted. We actually cannot find them uh, in our system. And because this is a very competitive environment, the habitat that has been lost to the Moribaculaceae is taken up by the Bacteroidaceae. And what we were even more surprised to find is that even when we stopped the laxative treatment, Moribaculaceae are just lost and we cannot get them back. And so here I'm going to stop because whether or not you care about the Moribaculaceae specifically, this is a huge change to our microbiota. If I had to tell you about something like this that happened in a macro scale ecosystem, this would be akin to saying that uh, all primates or all felines were going away from a habitat. 
What we do know about the Moriboculaceae is that they're disappearing from industrialized human communities. So for example, in traditional communities that we find throughout the world, uh, from Tanzania to uh, the Amazons, Moriboculaceae have a very high prevalence in these humans. Between uh, 65 and 90% of these humans have this family present. While in industrialized communities, they have very low prevalence. And of course, the question becomes, well, if we lose Moriboculaceae, why is this a problem? Why should we care about having diverse communities of bacteria inside us? And this takes us back to the different scales of the problem. At the beginning of the talk, we talked about how the different length scales uh, of, between global and micron scale have similarities. And now we're going to talk about uh, the different time scales. So for humans, one generation takes about uh, 20 to 30 years. But for microbes, one generation is in the order of tens of minutes. What this means is that when we change our diet, when we take a laxative, when we change something about our lifestyle, the bacteria are going to adapt really, really quickly. But we don't. Our lifestyle has been very much changed over the past 150 years due to industrialization. And our bacteria have adapted and they produce different compounds because they're able to grow on different types of food, not anymore as much on fiber, but uh, on processed foods. And the problem that has ar arisen is the fact that now our own biology is what is mismatched to our industrialized lifestyle. The key here is that there's really nothing fundamentally wrong or right with industrialized lifestyle. It's just that we have not evolved with it. And we think that because it mismatches our biology, the microbes that have been selected uh, by industrialization produce compounds that can lead to inflammation. And so part of the problem is that we're selecting out the ones that were evolutionarily advantageous for our well-being because they were helping us, say, break down uh, some of the roots that uh, we would eat when we were hunter-gatherers. The key point here is that bacteria have changed in response to our change in lifestyle, but we as humans are not keeping up. And uh, we think that is why we're seeing this incredible increase in uh, inflammatory and immune system uh, diseases. So one question that, that then we ask is, does Mitobacillaceae actually play a role in this industrialized diseases? Uh, and this is a, a work that uh, uh, has mostly been led by Dr. Marty Blazer, who's at Rutgers University. And he works on a model with uh, type 1 diabetes. One of the things that he found is that uh, when these type 1 diabetes susceptible mice are exposed to antibiotics, they have a much worse uh, occurrence of disease. And so here is just shown uh, with this graph with the, the diabetes-free probability decreases when the mice are exposed to these antibiotics. So here you can see that uh, more mice are exposed uh, or have a, a progression of the disease when they have uh, antibiotics uh, administered. And this is in the dashed blue line compared to the control. So by the end of the experiment, only about 10% uh, of the mice are diabetes free when they're exposed uh, to antibiotics. And one of the things that uh, we thought that was really interesting is that Depending on the presence of Moribaculaceae, there was an association between uh, diabetes development. So the mice that did have Moribaculaceae were much less likely to uh, incur this disease. And this takes us a little bit back uh, uh, to one of the overarching themes of, uh, of the field, is that we think that one of the reasons why we see so many more modern diseases has to do with the loss of sound on these microbes. So in the case of uh, traditional populations, we have a complex and diverse microbiota compared to the loss of microbes that we have in industrialized diseases. And this comes with uh, a two-sided coin. On one side, we don't have infectious diseases in the industrialized world, but at the same time, we have to fight uh, the inflammatory diseases. And really our goal here is trying to find a way to eliminate both infectious uh, and inflammatory diseases. So this is, takes us to the third vignette, uh, which is uh, thinking about uh, the ecosystem restoration. This is a very hard problem, not only at the level of uh, the global scale, but also the level of our own gut. If you think about uh, probiotics that are sold uh, all the time in supermarkets, they have been shown to only have uh, limited efficacy. And in some sense, this makes a lot of sense. If you were to think about uh, a tornado or forest fires uh, sweeping through Yellowstone, you can't just add uh, a random species of rabbit and expect it to restore the ecosystem. And that's a little bit what we're doing with probiotics. We're trying to insert a single species and it might not colonize. In fact, a lot of the time it's not able to colonize. 
And as you can see here, part of the reason why it's not able to colonize is that these communities are incredibly dense and incredibly competitive. So this is a very hard task. And one of the questions that we ask in our research is when we lose more reculacy, can we actually get it back? In our mouse model, doing this type of uh, fecal microbiota transplants is really easy because it turns out that uh, mice are coprophagic, meaning that uh, they eat their own stool. Again, not the best topic uh, before lunch, uh, but I hope uh, you'll, uh, you'll come along with me with, the, with these experiments and uh, these uh, discoveries. In these experiments, uh, by reducing more reculacy, we really didn't know what to expect. Uh, because as I said, this it was a community that was very, very dense. But what we were really excited to find is that Moribaculaceae was actually able to recolonize stably. And in fact, even more excitingly, in this mouse model of type 1 diabetes, the reintroduction of Moribaculaceae rescued the phenotype uh, of uh, the diabetes. In fact, the mice that uh, had the antibiotics, but then were given Moribaculaceae a few days after, did not develop uh, the type 1 diabetes. So they were back uh, at uh, the normal rates uh, without having been given the antibiotics. An important lesson that we learned is the fact that reintroduction needs to occur in a non-perturbed environment to actually take hold. So in these two experiments, we, we reintroduced Moribaculaceae continuously over a period of several days, but in the experiment on the left, we only reintroduced it during the time of uh, laxative treatment exposure. While in the second experiment on the right, we allowed this exposure to happen over only a couple of days extra, and Moribaculaceae was able to come back out. So what this really tells us and really informs us in thinking about uh, what might be important for microbiota therapies is that we need to act in times when the environment uh, is uh, normalized. And now zooming back out uh, in terms of thinking about restoring ecosystems, this makes a lot of sense. If you wanted to transplant a tropical forest into a desert, the desert better have water to support this growth. And we think about uh, the microbiota in the same way, really focusing in on this ecosystem perspective. So what I've told you about today is that industrialization has changed our lifestyle and this has affected our microbiota. I've told you also that over the counter drugs can lead to the disappearance of these key microbiota members, uh, for example, in the case of Moribaculaceae. And importantly, I've told you about that uh, ecosystem restoration really requires this balanced physical environment. And I like to think about this uh, from the perspective of what we're doing to the macro scale that it's, I think is really helping. I really believe that the solution to the destruction of these ecosystems that has been caused by industrialization has to come through a respect and a better understanding of nature coupled with improved technologies uh, to allow humans and wildlife to coexist. And I think this important parallel also needs to happen uh, for medicine and for a microbiota. So in medicine, we're very much seeing this large shift towards personalized medicine. But until our bodies evolve to require different stimuli, we will need to improve our diet and, and go back also to nature alongside the improvements in our technology and our ability to restore our microbial diversity. So I think for better or for worse, for, for a while longer, we'll, we'll have to eat our broccoli. One of the things that also I would like to stress here is uh, the fact that we need diverse teams to solve these problems. What microbiologists and uh, biomedical engineers and doctors say alone is just not enough. I, I, what I think that we really need is to understand uh, the psychology, the anthropological implications to lead to this system level changes and uh, improve our lifestyle. One of the things that I think is very important is that we've known a lot of these lessons for a long time. I, by telling you that we need to eat healthy, I'm not telling you anything new. But we all know what happens to New Year resolutions and uh, when they are about diet changes they don't last very long. So what I think that uh, we need is really legislation to implement these changes uh, and make sure that they happen on a wide scale. So to end, I'd like to uh, uh, thank my team and thank the people that uh, have made uh, this uh, event today possible. Uh, it's been a, a really wonderful experience. Uh, I trained uh, in the States and I was able to come back to Canada and it's been super exciting to start a lab uh, at UBC. and. Uh, uh, I'm really grateful for uh, the opportunity to talk to with everyone, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your questions. And uh, uh, thanks so much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Carolina. Um, this is fascinating, a fascinating topic, and you've raised so many questions. Now, speaking of questions, um, I'm told that we have a slight technical problem. 
in that the raise hand function that I mentioned earlier appears not to be working uh, at this moment. So there is a different way for you, the audience, to send questions to us. And that's through email. We're going to go back to a good old, good old fashioned email. <laughs> and the email Carrier pigeon I... works too, right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, we only have 30 minutes. So <laughs> we're going to work with email. And the email address should show up on the screen. If it doesn't, the email address is cspa at cdnhost.ca. So cspa at cdnhost.ca. So please send those uh, email questions and we'll do our best to uh, answer as many as possible. I say we, it's going to be Carolina answering your questions, not so much me. But let me start with a couple of questions of my own uh, questions that uh, come to mind and I, as I listen to your presenta presentation and I, as I think about the topic. You know, you've talked about uh, how environmental changes uh, affect our microbiome, but can, could we come to a point where we purposefully change our microbiome through specific interventions uh, where we try to achieve sort of a, a, a health point? Can we, should we uh, play, so to speak, or, or deliberately change our microbiome with drugs, chemicals, compounds? What do you think? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the I, I really like to think about this type of question uh, based again on our understanding of, of natural ecosystems at the large scale. It's, it's much easier to know when an ecosystem is uh, really unstable than when it's a good ecosystem. So if you had to say compare to national parks and you ask which one is healthier, that's a really hard question. Uh, but you know when an ecosystem is not healthy. And that's the same thing with it, our microbiota. We know that there's certain signatures in the composition that uh, will be uh, affecting negatively human health. One of the ways in which I think that microbiota therapy can really act uh, is at the level of, uh, of newborn infants. So for example, one of the things that happens is that babies that are born through BSC section start out with a much lower diversity of microbes. And this later on has effects on, uh, uh, on allergies and asthma. And so at that stage, when the microbiota is really about to be formed, I think the microbiota therapy can really help to reinstate that diversity that, that we need for long-term health. But one of the challenges is that our, our microbiota is, is really dynamic and it's very personal. So our history very much affects what's good and what's bad. So understanding the context and understanding the, the, the personality of our microbiota then uh, becomes very important. Mm -hmm. So in the example of the C-section that you uh, just mentioned, it would be possible to introduce diversity in the microbiome to avoid some of the issues like asthma and immunological uh, conditions. So you think we can get to a point where we we could do that? Yeah, well, in, I, absolutely. And in some of the, the changes that we can do, in some sense, we're, we're modifying and engineering our microbiota every day. Whenever we change our, our, our diet in a way that is significant, uh, this will change the microbes that are present. And one of the goals, for example, for a uh, um, particularly for prematurely born, born babies that may not be exposed uh, to the normal microbiota that you would go through the birth canal, is to make sure that they have uh, those microbes that help them protect from, uh, uh, from invaders. So for example, in the case of necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a, a, a disease that uh, affects a lot of premature babies, this is, comes from the lack of, of, a, of a microbiota that will be protective. Mm -hmm. It's actually connected to uh, a question that was asked by friends of ours who have a one-year-old, and that one-year-old essentially has been born in the pandemic context and has had limited contact with 
um, other children or other individuals. You know, when we think back of daycares, uh, daycares were very um, diverse <laughs> microbiological environment, uh, very rich microbiological environment. But that, but those newborns now in the last year have been less exposed, presumably, to diversity. So what can those parents do to bring that diversity? And it's not necessarily yeah. a condition at this point, but they're worried about bringing that genetic, oh, the microbiological diversity that will be useful. You know, the, some of the research that uh, is coming out that is really interesting uh, shows that um, babies that are exposed to more microbes are healthier later on. And this has been uh, uh, really shown causatively from the perspective of, uh, of, of asthma and, uh, uh, and allergies. And part of the idea is that our, we have evolved in an environment that was very, very full of different microbes, and our immune system needs to learn to attack and prevent infection from the right agents. And so with something like allergies, the problem is that our immune system has not been exposed to the right signals, and so it overreacts when it encounters uh, other pollutants or allergens, even though it doesn't really have a good reason to be trying to fight them uh, to prevent, uh, like to make sure for our health. And some of the things that I think are really fascinating that connect us to the microbiota is that, for example, kids that grow up with the dogs are much less likely to have allergies and asthma. If uh, uh, a kid uh, uses a, um, a pacifier, and particularly if that pacifier has been cleaned in the mouth of the mother, they're less likely to develop allergies. Uh, Second-born kids have Less likely are less likely to have these allergies, and kind of everything points to the fact that uh, what what is the, the commonality here is that all these factors, these agents that bring microbes into the house, help decrease the chances of this development of uh, of allergies. And and you know one thing that is interesting with the pandemic is that of course not only are we very separated from uh, the rest of human communities, but also we're using uh, antimicrobial compounds far more. And this is, of course, essential to prevent the spread of COVID, but also will prevent the spread of some of these microbes. And so this will have a societal impact. The challenge, though, is that it's going to be a chronic effect. It's not an acute mm. effect. And, and as humans, we're very good at dealing with uh, acute effects. And we can see this with, with COVID, how quickly people rallied up together to, to figure out a, a solution. But mm -hmm. with chronic conditions, if you have to act on a specific day and decide, is this baby going to receive antibiotics and try to solve something that could be acute right now versus is this going to affect uh, their chances of becoming obese 20 years from now, the doctor is more likely going to choose give the antibiotics now. Mm -hmm. There's a question from uh, the audience that, uh, that I can relate to, actually. <laughs> um, someone who's been uh, bit by a tick. Uh, often the uh, prescription is to take a course of antibiotics. Now, and it connects to the problem you were just raising. So there's a tick bite, and there's the possibility, possibility of Lyme disease, and then the person takes antibiotics. Yet that, and those antibiotics will have an impact on the microbiome. Uh, how can we still take those antibiotics because of course we want to avoid Lyme disease, but what can we do to minimize the impact while taking the antibiotic, minimize the impact on the microbiome? Is there any recipe, any <laughs> tricks we can use? Yeah. Well, so I, I should preface this uh, by saying that I'm not a medical doctor, so I can, uh, I can tell you what, uh, you know, what I would do, what my family would do, um, it, as well as kind of what we've seen from, from, from the science. So it, this is a very important question, and I think this is the direction where medicine needs to go, is that if we're going to have to start keeping uh, backups of our microbiota so that we can reimplant our microbiota after we've had to deplete it because of a colonoscopy prep, uh, because of having to take doses of antibiotics, and so that you know we can save our work uh, up until that point, and so that, then we, the idea would be to re-inoculate ourselves with uh, our own microbiota. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been shown with uh, a lot of work uh, from uh, uh, from Israel, from the um, the Seagull and the uh, Elenav labs, where they saw that uh, patients that were taking uh, antibiotics were able to return to their normal state 
much faster if, uh, if they were uh, re-exposed to their, their normal microbiota. In fact, thinking things like probiotics slowed down with this recovery or, or changed the course of it. And so we're, we're not there right now. Uh, fecal microbiota transplants are only used uh, in, uh, in a situa situations of, uh, uh, of, of emergency. But uh, so this is not gonna help you right now if you've uh, uh, been bitten by a tick, and I'm sorry that it's a very <laughs> scary uh, occurrence. But some of the things that, uh, that you can do is that I, I, I would probably err on the side of uh, eating more diverse types of fiber. Try to keep the microbes that you have in you there. Uh, try to keep them alive. Um, you, you, other things that, uh, that I think are really helpful is, is taking microbes in small doses. For example, fermented foods expose us to, to microbes in a way that uh, our immune system responds to positively. So there was a lot of work coming out of uh, from Stanford showing that uh, the immune system actually gets activated in a way that uh, uh, is good for responding to, uh, uh, to infections by being exposed to these commensal microbes that come in yogurt, kimchi, and, and these other uh, prebiotic foods. So mm -hmm. they, again, it's, a, it's like this, this balance of what our, our system is expecting to see, uh, and this exposure to microbes is, uh, is very important. Carolina, we have... Uh... We have an audience of public servants, and I'm sure some of them come from regulatory agencies or policy-making um, departments. What do regulators or governments need to know um, at this point? What do they need to prepare for? Because some, fairly often we see the science moving quickly and the whole regulatory apparatus taking a little longer sometimes to catch up. So what should regulators or governments uh, know at this point or be prepared for, should we consider limits on some compounds or some practices? What are your thoughts on that? I think uh, limits on compounds is something that will have to happen. You know, the uh, again, kind of going back to the uh, responding to acute problems and, and how much we want to act. I think for, um, for both uh, patients and the general populations, when, when there is a problem, the impetus is to try to act and take something, take a medicine, even though sometimes this problem will be resolving by itself. And, and so the word, I think the regulations need to happen is in to try to make sure that uh, when we have, uh, when we take compounds that might disrupt a microbiota, that we do it when we, when we have to do this and that we don't do it just as a, um, as a way of, uh, of trying to do something for a problem that might be solved. And so this is, of course, not something that only affects legislators, but also uh, affects uh, doctors. So I think that we need to move into, into a regime that we understand more the interplay uh, between our, our microbes and, uh, uh, and our health. And, and I think so much will be done as we, uh, as we try to, to push uh, healthier diets uh, in, in schools, in the uh, cafeterias. Uh, it, it, I think it really needs to be a system level change. I think they will see massive impact uh, by uh, uh, promoting things that uh, are already being promoted. For example, breastfeeding uh, in, uh, uh, for, for newborns, uh, trying to reduce the number of C-sections and, and all of these things that kind of bring us back to what we have evolved with. Mm -hmm. In a way, and, and you touched upon this in, in your uh, response, right? right a second ago, in a way, when we were thinking about personalized medicine, uh, I think many of us, I'll include myself, we were thinking of, if we understand our genetic, genetic material, if we understand our DNA, then we will be better able to customize medical interventions um, to each one of us. So if we understand our genetics, we can better um, prescribe interventions. But have we missed the fact that the microbiome is such an important component of our health and that we will no longer only have to understand our genetic material, but understand also the genetic material that's living, the microbiological genetic material that's living within us? Yeah, Mark, that's a great point. I, you know, and of course, I'm, a, <laughs> I've, I've drank the Kool-Aid uh, for the microbiome. So I, I definitely think that this is going to be uh, a, a very important factor. And even if just for the fact that uh, these microbes will affect the way that uh, drugs are delivered. So some microbes can change. Uh, most of the drugs that we look at will be changed by the microbiome. And even things like that we think 
we don't think very much about taking, for example, drinking uh, diet drinks. You know, we think that these don't affect us because they're sugars that uh, human bodies cannot absorb. But in practice, the bacteria break them down and still give us calories for them. So we, we're an integrated system. We can't get away from them. And we, we need to figure out how to work with them to make us healthier. Integrated systems, that's, that's, those are always complex problems. <laughs> yes, very much so. A question from uh, the audience here. Um, there's been a fair bit in the media about how the microbiome can influence mental health. Um, what do you think are the possible mechanisms that explain these interactions between bacteria living in our guts and our mental health? What is the connection there? Yeah, that, that's a beautiful question. It's something that we're, we're deeply interested in. And, and honestly, coming into the microbiota field, I was a little bit skeptical about this connection uh, until it became really obvious how, um, how this would happen. So again, the, whatever we produce in the gut makes it uh, through our blood system. And a lot of compounds can cross the blood-brain barrier and affect our brain. And we see this really strongly, particularly in pediatric models of, uh, uh, of different inflammatory diseases. If, the, if some of the, the inflammation or, or some of the disease changes happen during development, and these affect the microbiota, and they affect the compounds that are produced. It, it, it turns out that a lot of the bacteria that produce anti-inflammatory compounds are bacteria that are not very good at dealing with, uh, with perturbations that can come through inflammation. And these are very specialized bacteria that basically their, their main function in the gut is producing the anti-inflammatory compounds that are uptake in, uh, by the intestinal cells. And so if, when these go missing, then the anti-inflammatory compounds are not present and so exacerbate the, the inflammation and this inflammation can also go to the brain. So uh, the relation is very complex. For example, in the case of uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, having a microbiota can actually be problematic. So there's been uh, uh, some studies that showing that the use of antibiotics can actually be positive in uh, reducing symptoms. But in other cases, it can be really uh, detrimental. So some work in, uh, in my lab in collaboration with uh, the Sierra lab at UBC, we're starting to show that uh, early life inflammation changes the microbiota and leads to a, a memory deficit uh, uh, in, uh, in, in these animals. And one of the things that we're investigating is whether the, the addition of some of the compounds that are normally produced by a healthy microbiota can ameliorate some of these effects. And so because this, uh, so many of these effects compound over years of a changed microbiota, I think that we really need to address them uh, early on in, in, in childhood and, and really make sure that uh, you know, we, we set up our, our, our kids with as much of the diversity that they need to, uh, to be able to uh, not have inflammation and not have some of the risks of the uh, these increased chances also of, uh, um, uh, of disorders uh, um, of the brain. Thank you. I, I want to go back to other questions from the audience. Um, and there's two questions that are a bit linked. Um, you know, you've mentioned that the Industrial Revolution has had an impact on us. In fact, that was the title of <laughs> one of the title slides. So for those of us in industrial societies, what can we do to prevent this erosion or this um, decrease in diversity in uh, beneficial, microbacteria, beneficial bacteria? And um, maybe a link to this is a large number of people take either laxatives or antiacids. What are our choices um, um, to try to minimize the impact? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and, and um, uh, you know, the, I don't think that there's there's a general answer. You know, in some cases, like I think that uh, uh, depending on specific conditions, there can be, uh, uh, say, uh, taking different types of fiber may be able to support uh, your your microbiota. But but one of the things that uh, uh, that I think it's really important uh, that is happening in science right now is that we we are trying to preserve the diversity that comes from these traditional populations and and create mm -hmm. banks of of these microbes that, uh, that are disappearing. And, and a challenge is that if we save them, what do we actually do with them? Like, let's say that we were able to uh, resurrect um, mammoths. If we put them back in an ecosystem, what does that mean? Uh, will it make it better? It's mm. hard to know. And, 
And so I think this is kind of where, where, uh, where we need to think about uh, our early childhood development again, is that if we want to set up a, a diverse ecosystem from, from scratch so that we can bring it up and, and keep it as, as diverse and resilient as, uh, uh, as we can do it. Uh, you know, one of my kids was born by C-section. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, I have worried about uh, the impact of the microbiota while I was there uh, being, uh, being opened up. of like, what did I do? I know that this is going to be problematic. And, and in practice, we, you know, we have to adapt with our, with our history. And so uh, our, our microbes have been built up over multiple life occurrences of when we had to take antibiotics and uh, times in which uh, we had to uh, uh, take different medicines that will affect our microbiota. And we just can't prevent that from happening. But what we can do is to make healthier choices. You know, for example, in the perspective, again, with kids taking laxatives, please feed your kids more veggies, even though it's hard. There, there are choices on a day-to-day -day basis where we, it's not the easiest choice. Industrialization has brought on a lot of easy choices, um, but where we can do better. So for example, instead of taking laxatives, we need to have uh, uh, better options for veggies that uh, uh, busy parents can do when they are trying to force down a carrot <laughs> uh, down the kid's mouth. And so this collaboration between uh, 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 technology development and uh, legislation and, and doctors really needs to happen in a concerted way so that we can make sure that uh, the easy choice is also the choice that uh, uh, is better for our health. That's a great, absolutely perfect segue to another question from the audience. So you're talking about multidisciplinary approaches or, or different lenses to, um, to attacking this problem or to, to addressing this problem. Yet we know it's difficult. I mean, researchers are busy doing research. GPs are busy in their practices, in their clinics. And they are really busy <laughs> right now with all kinds of challenges, regulators and so on and so forth. Um, is there any source of inspiration, anything that you have seen in different parts of the world where um, we are able to bring those different disciplines, those different lenses that all need to work together in a complementary way? Is there any source of inspiration, anything you've seen that could inspire us in Canada about doing things differently? About yeah, bringing I mean, all those people together, I'm sorry. Well, uh, you know, the, uh, like I said, I don't mean to uh, toot my own, my own horn, but CIFAR uh, has been amazing at that. Um, so it's kind of very much the goal of, uh, um, of CIFAR is to bring people together from different perspectives to ensure that some of this important uh, public health agendas come, come through. And so th through CIFAR, some of the things that, uh, that we're doing is, for example, developing curricula uh, to uh, teach about the microbiota to, uh, uh, to new doctors that are, that are coming through through, through a, a public health cu curriculum. And uh, more of this needs to happen. I, I think that now it's, it's just become plainly obvious that these, these problems are, are much bigger than the microbiology can solve. Um, and in um, the, the other part, which I... I feel very strongly about it, and you know, it's, it's the reason why I'm here is that we can't, as researchers, we can't just keep staying in, in universities and, uh, and just do our science. Um, we're living in an era of disinformation and the, the, the voices of, of people that are directly studying this work needs to come out and it's our responsibility to make sure that, uh, that this work does come out and that we work with the stakeholders such that uh, these problems can be solved. And so I, I I'm a strong believer that uh, uh, the, the research doesn't just belong within the universities, that the public needs to be involved and that, that uh, uh, if we want to see more progress, uh, that the next boundaries are, are so big, you know, that all the low hanging fruits have, have been taken. Mm. We've had many, many years of research. Uh, now we are to a, a new type of, uh, uh, of science. Carolina, this is so important and I cannot agree with you more. Um, I spent most of my career as a researcher, and now I'm in the federal uh, system because I do believe that researchers, scientists do need to bring their message and their lens to, uh, to the greater government and to influence a greater system. So I'm really grateful for you taking the time 
out of your very busy life to um, step, step out of your lab and uh, work with us in, in government. It's been an extraordinarily, extraordinarily informative uh, session. Karina, I can't thank you enough uh, for your presentation, for your time. Um, we also want to thank CIFAR, uh, our, the partner with the Canada School of Public Service for helping the school bring these events to uh, this audience. We want to, of course, thank you, the audience, for participating in very large numbers today. Um, and your feedback is always welcome and it's important to us. So you'll be invited to complete a, an evaluation uh, through uh, an email that will come to you in the next few days. Um, and please do consult uh, the webpage for other courses, events, programs that the Canada School for Public Service offers. The next event in this series of Canada, the cutting edge uh, will be broadcast on Tuesday, January 25th on the topic of quantum information. And the event will be moderated by one of my colleagues, Dr. Nipun Vats, Assistant Deputy Minister at ISAD, and will feature uh, Dr. Stephanie Simmons, a Canada Research Chair in the Physics Department at Simon Fraser University. So more details on reg registration will be uh, posted on the website. Carolina, so many thanks uh, to, to you uh, for the work that you do, for your passion and for your willingness to communicate. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to CIFAR and thank you to the Canada School for Public Service. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me.